Well, my dear friends, it's October, and the season of the witch is well and truly upon us. And what better way to celebrate October and Halloween than with a series of creepy anthology videos, the first of which you'll be getting tonight. Eight stories in all for you this evening, all creepy, terrifying, and horrendous in their own ways, and all by the wonderful author Ryan Brenneman. Well, my dear friends, we've made it to the middle of the week. This is the first of four long anthology videos I have planned for you in the build-up to Halloween, so I think it is once again time for you to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Tommy threw the damn blue squeaky ball through the air again, wiping the dirt and spit on his khaki shorts. Once more, with an incredible enthusiasm for so early in the morning, his Labrador retriever ran off after it, chasing it to the edge of the untrimmed grassy field. As the dog, the one his mom had named Butter, fumbled around, snapping at the elusive ball, Tommy pulled out his phone and started scrolling through his text messages. Amusedly, he laughed at the latest one from his mother. 8.11am. The brat given you any problems yet? Mother panted as she rounded Tommy's legs. With a sigh, Tommy reached down and tugged at the ball. Mother held firm, but with some effort, Tommy was able to pull the ball free. He tossed it again right to the edge of the field. With his left hand, because his right one was coated in puppy slime, Tommy responded. 8.23am. Yeah, but it's fine. We're in back round. Butter grabbed the ball, almost toppling over her own feet and into the field, and came sprinting back. As Tommy pried the ball away, he got another message from his mother. 8.24am. Don't stay out too long. Ran into Mr. Anthony this morning. Said he thinks he heard coyotes in the field last night. Mr. Anthony? He was their next door neighbour. Tommy didn't know him that well, just knew that he was friendly enough and that his wife passed away about two years ago. Rarely saw him. Hobbled around with a black wood cane whenever he went out to his garden. Long, white Santa Claus beard. He didn't know his mum ever talked to Mr. Anthony. Tommy threw the ball. Butter chased the ball. 8.24am. Oh, I'll keep an eye out. Thanks. Looking out to the field, Tommy wondered when the last time they'd seen a coyote was. Months, surely. Before that, maybe years, they weren't common. Plus, it wasn't like they were wolves or anything really threatening. Coyotes were small. Smaller than Butter, surely, and she was still a puppy. Tommy wasn't worried at all. Butter gave Tommy the ball rather easily this time, dropping it on the ground. She nudged it playfully closer with her snout. She let her tongue dangle as she panted. She sat like a good dog. A good, patient dog. Waiting for Tommy to play fetch. One more throw? Tommy asked. Butter jumped up, lunging for the ball, leaving muddy footprints all over Tommy's pants. Get down, he ordered bitterly. Go get it. Launching the ball, he realized he'd overdone it. The ball flew further than before, and it landed about ten feet inside the field. Oh, shit, he murdered as Butter took off, diving headfirst into the long grass. He disappeared after the ball. Confident that Butter would not only find the ball, but also return, and hoping to keep his involvement at a minimum, Tommy focused back on his phone. As he scrolled through videos, hoping to find something good to watch, he saw Butter jump out of the field, her head raised confidently. She was carrying something. Good. The last thing Tommy wanted was to get some ticks while searching for the dog's damn squeaky blue ball. Without looking at the dog, Tommy lowered his hand and told Butter to give it. She seemed to do so willingly, but before Tommy could say, Good girl, he realized it didn't feel right. Tommy looked down at the object she'd brought him. It wasn't the damn squeaky blue ball. It was a stick. No, not a stick. 
a cane. A black wood cane. Mr. Anthony, Tommy murmured, kneeling down beside a panting butter to examine the find. How in the... He noticed the teeth marks before he could finish his sentence, but they weren't butters. The entire cane was covered in deep, savage bite marks. Did the coyotes... His thoughts trailed off as butter started to growl. She faced the field. Tommy looked up, clutching the stick close. Something moved, rustling the long blades of grass. It was heading right for them. Racing, sprinting, bounding and growling. Butter started to bark as the thing broke free of the long grass. It was much bigger than a coyote, almost like a bear more than anything else. Long black fur fell around its muscular frame. Long talon-like claws raked the ground. Tommy stumbled over Butter, knocking them both to the ground. Whereas Butter was able to quickly recover and bolt towards the house, Tommy was not. Tommy was left, staring down the creature's broad nose as it slowed to a halt. Almost atop him, the creature took deep, pounding breaths as it seemed to size him up. Tommy, slowly backing off, noticed that the creature held something between its massive jaws. It was Mr. Antony. Lifeless and pale. The creature proceeded to drop the corpse at Tommy's feet, freeing its massive fangs. Tommy was sure they were meant for him. Positive. This was it. This was the end. He cowered and waited for pain and death. And yet, it didn't come. The monstrous beast simply panted, with its blood-smeared tongue dangling from its mouth. It sat, right behind Mr. Antony's corpse. Tommy was unsure of what to do, of what it wanted, until it leaned forward and, ever so gently, nudged on the corpse with its oversized snout. It sat there and waited, like a good dog, like a good, patient dog waiting for Tommy to play fetch. There was no exit that she could find, only more endless corridors of repeating reflections. She felt like she was chasing her own terrified face. But no, she wasn't doing the chasing. He was. She was pursued through the funhouse. Chased by laughter and transient images in her periphery, she had to force herself forward, onwards, towards freedom. Away from him. Away from the black and white cloud. Her right hand smeared sweat and oil across the mirrors as she dragged it along. It was a trick her mother had taught her back when she was a child. You can get out of any maze in the world, she had told her, if you just put your right hand on the wall and follow it out. His image, the clown's face, kept appearing on the glass, darting around her from places unseen. She knew he was close, for she heard his laughter, and she heard his footsteps, but she couldn't be sure where. Sometimes it seemed like he was right in front of her, so real, so close. Black diamond eyes and a ragged, colourless suit, tattered collar and wiry black hair. Razor blades embedded in his fingertips. An ashen smile scorched across his face. But he was never actually there. He was close, but, but such was the madness that was the funhouse. She couldn't be certain what was real and what was mirage. Each mirror was pristine like crystal. Every image held weight and malice. Each one felt real. Where are you? She mumbled through exhausted lips. Her head turning and twisting as she fell through corridors and corners, hollering in spite at his mockingly curled lips. Where are you? The exit must have been close, surely. She felt like she'd been wandering for hours, and she'd started to pass areas she knew she'd already been. 
She could trace her smeared handprints across the mirrored walls. Finally, there was a long corridor before her, the longest straight shot yet, the only place she hadn't yet tried. Finding her last desperate reserves of energy, she bolted down the path. But as she reached its end, she realized that there was nowhere left to go. Her hand fell into a corner, and she traced the solid black wall to the other corner, and she finally rested. Not because she wanted to, but because she'd run out of places to go. Her only option was to turn back. Back towards the approaching laughter. Towards the clown with the razor fingers. She pounded against the glass with her palms at first. She begged to God, to anyone, for a way out, for help. Then her begging, curdled by fear, became rage. Primal rage as the footsteps seemed set around the corner. It was her and the clown. She looked back the way she'd come. It was just one long hallway. No way in but one. No way out but dead ahead. It was a straight shot. Just her and him. Just life and death. Twisting her torso, she yelled as her fist met one of the glass panels on her left. The glass screamed and bloody shards fell onto the floor. Smearing her fresh blood across the pieces, she found the largest and most intimidating blade the shattering had made. and She gripped it so tightly that the edges easily split her skin. One way out. Her versus him. Fight or flight. And she'd made her decision. She wouldn't go down without a fight. The clown was coming. He was rounding the corner. Sprinting through the funhouse like the madman he was. His laughter echoed down on her. Falling around her from seemingly every direction. And she thought she was ready. Immediately he came, his reflection shot across the dozens of mirrors that spanned the hall, his smile glistening across dozens of faces. But he only appeared on the mirrors. No one had rounded the corner. In the reflections, the clown stood with shoulders squared and predatory arms held at his sides, like it was staring her down. But no one stood at the end of the hall. She wondered if he could have been standing around the corner, waiting for her to come to him instead of the other way round. But his reflection overtook hers on every mirror, as if he stood between her and every panel in the entire hall. Something was off. Come on, she screamed, her weapon poised and ready. I'm right here. Show yourself. The laughing, that seemed like it was coming from everywhere, stopped. The smiling reflections gazed at her, and then, seemingly, they gazed past her, as a tapping sound came from the glass behind her. Turning her head, and only her head, she noticed that the clown was reflected behind her as well, on the entire dead-end wall. It was like he stood right there, but that couldn't be. She touched those mirrors herself. The smear of her hand still sat across the clown's grinning lips. But that's when she realized that the tapping had come from the mirror itself. The clown reflection before her was waving at her. It was the only reflection that did so. Around her, all the images started to tap and knock against the glass, each one moving independently of the others. They chuckled. They mocked her from inside the mirrors. And then, the clown's smiles all faded in unison. Their faces, their cheeks, started to tremble as a carnivorous hunger burned behind their eyes. It started with the one that had been waving. He raised his hand and placed the razor blade embedded inside his index finger on the panel of the glass. And then he started to carve downwards. The screeching of dissected glass filled the funhouse as all the reflections followed the lead at their own pace, cutting their mirrors in two from the inside out. She felt angry, 
Boiling tears fill her eyes, causing her to only grip that large shard tighter in her hands. The mirrors around her started to crack as the clowns started to push on them from the inside out. They were pushing their way out from inside, birthing themselves into the world like snakes from their eggs. As their arms and faces stretched out from the mirrors, she bent over and picked up a second shard of glass. With a deep breath in and a long, hissing breath out, she calmed herself. Blood dripping from her hands, she braced herself. Her situation was more complicated than before, but the basics were still the same. There was one hall, one way out. She wouldn't go down without a fight. No, it's not, Angelica sighed, rolling her eyes. It's too, chuckled Felicia. Just ask your boy, Charles. Said he couldn't get three feet past the door before he could hear the moaning. Angelica shook her head as Felicia started circling her, making ghostly noises, her collar pulled up over the back of her head. With an arched eyebrow, Angelica crossed her arms and stared Felicia down. Shh, knock it off, she ordered. Felicia listened, relaxing, but with a sly chuckle. Oh, come on, she said warmly. Look at it. Angelica turned her head. The Usterling's house fit perfectly beneath the grey, swirling clouds. The black shutters were infested with vines and rot. The once white siding had long lost all of its sheen, infected by moss and grimy black mold. The crack posts around the front porch gave it almost a twisted, grinning appearance, with two cracked windows serving as the empty, haunting eyes. It looked almost like it was alive. Ooh, if there was ever a house to be haunted, Angela smirked before moving to walk away. Wait, Felicia called. Girl, look at this thing. I did, Angelica said, giggling if only to amuse her friend. Did you not see me? I mean, really, look. The damn thing's got one of those weird-ass spire-looking things. Gee, it's as old as hell. Don't you want to see what's inside? I know what's inside, Angelica said back. Mold, dust, a lot of unstable floorboards, and loads of cobwebs. Man, I told you, this house is 200 years old. It's actually 172, Angelica interrupted. Felicia's jaw dropped. You looked that up just so you could be right, didn't you? No, Angelica quickly lied. Uh, just happened to find it. You've always got to be right, girl. It's annoying. Not as annoying as this, Angelica said, motioning to Felicia and the Ursterling's house. Come on, Felicia pouted. Don't tell me you're too chicken. Everyone who's, well, anyone, goes into that house. Do they all come out, though? Angelica asked, jokingly. I heard they don't. Besides, I'm not chicken. There's just nothing in there to see. What? You don't want to see a ghost? Angelica let out an inaudible and exasperated sigh through her still-smiling mouth. Oh, there's no such thing as ghost, Felicia. It's not haunted. Felicia crossed her arms, pressing her tongue deep into her cheek. Angelica could see the conniving gears turning inside her head, like Felicia's pleased eyes were made of glass. Hmm. Prove me wrong, then. Angelica chuckled once, and then she also crossed her arms. The two looked like they'd fallen into a stalemate. But Angelica knew she'd already lost. Felicia had played her like a fiddle. You know me too well, she sighed. She uncrossed her arms and groaned. Angelica pushed open the house's rusty gate. Felicia, satisfied, grinned. 
<laughs> Knew you looked that damn house up, she said, cockily. What do you want me to do? Angelica asked. Felicia leaned in, resting one arm on Angelica's right shoulder, while pointing up at the house with the other. That window, she said, pointing to the room underneath the spire. See it? The one with the shades still drawn. Get to that bedroom, pull those shades open, give me a nice smile and a thumbs up. Hey, maybe I'll give a wave or two. I'll snap your picture just to prove that ghosts aren't real, of course, and we'll be good. Angelica shook Felicia off her. Why do you get off on this shit? Angelica asked. Felicia just shrugged. Annoyed and only slightly amused, Angelica started walking towards the front door. You're so full of shit, she called back. Felicia, who was too busy texting everyone she knew that oh, Angelica is actually going to go into the hustling place, replied to the accusation with a simple, <laughs> yep. Creak, my creak. Angelica stepped onto the ancient porch. She could feel the soggy, forgotten boards bending beneath her weight. Man, I don't want to go to the second story of this thing, she mumbled. It's not going to support my ass. Her hand trembled as she reached for the doorknob. Glancing backwards, she was glad to see that Felicia's face was still buried in her phone where she couldn't see. Taking a deep breath as her palm met cold rusted metal. She turned the door. Unfortunately, yet unexpectedly unlocked, the door opened to welcome her inside. Creeping through a short, muggy entry hall, she entered into the heart of the house. The scene before her was as decrepit as she imagined it would be. It might have been totally dark, had it not been for the rotten holes in the ceiling that bled grey daylight into the shambles that someone had once called home. The entryway was surprisingly open. Angelica had expected more broken furniture, more evidence of the lives that used to be, but it seemed to be nothing more than an empty shell. Only a single, broken chandelier had been left behind. It dangled from the ceiling by a thread, covered in layers of dust and filth. A balcony stretched around the entryway. Stairs to the second floor were on Angelica's left. She was actually amazed. There didn't seem to be any cobwebs. Any ghosts? Angelica hollered into the house. She didn't know what she'd expected. An answer? An echo? She got nothing, and that should have settled her. Should have. She felt like the damn thing was breathing. Don't know if I mentioned, Felicia called at her. But you gotta go inside to reach the second floor. Don't know if that helps or not. It is pretty complicated, but I'm hoping it'll at least get you on your way. Angelica slammed the door shut behind her, drowning out Felicia's hyena-like cackling. Alone inside the house, she decided there was nothing to fear. Even so, she moved slowly towards the stairs. She tiptoed up them, cautiously taking each step with a measured precision and delicacy. They creaked and moaned beneath her weight, but they held her. She was okay with the moaning. Huh. Maybe trees have ghosts, she thought. That's why all wood moans when you step on it. She smiled, reaching the top of the stairs. Running her hands through her frizzy hair, she took a moment to breathe. Not that it was a particularly easy task. The dust in the air was thick, and it felt like it was trying to clog Angelica's lungs covering her mouth with the collar of her shirt. Angelica moved along the banister. Gripping it with her hand, 
She could swear she felt the wood tremble as if it, itself, pulsed with life. She assured herself it was nothing more than the trembling beats of her own panicky heart. The floor still creaked, still groaned under her footfalls. The room she needed was just up ahead, up in the shadows. But above the creaking floors, Angelica started to realize something else. There were sounds very obvious sounds. The floorboards groaning, her own labored breathing. But there was something else, a noise she wasn't making. A muffled and labored droning. And it was coming from in front of her, from the bedroom she was supposed to go into. For a moment, there was fear. Fear always came first. Fear needed no thought to exist. No rationality, no understanding. And so first, there was fear. There was a ghost. And then came anger. Could Felicia be tricking her? Could this all have been set up? They were friends. They pranked each other. But this was all new kinds of low. That anger drove Angelica to the closed bedroom door. And then came doubt, and it slowed her. It made her hand hover just above the doorknob. The doubt that the fear had been too easily dismissed. The doubt that she was wrong. The doubt that maybe... Just maybe, she was still alone in that house, that no one waited for her on the other side, at least no one living. Even though she fought it desperately, her hand lowered down onto the doorknob like it was a magnet and her hand had been forged of lead. The end result was inevitable. When her palm finally found its perch, she followed through if only out of pure adrenaline. She turned the doorknob. Inside, the room was black. No rot let the outside light in from above, and none seemed able to creep inwards from where Angelica stood in the open doorway. All she could see was a short little hall that seemed to lead into the larger bedroom chamber. Beyond it, she noticed the faintest of blood-red outlines, where the sun ate along the edge of the blinds, begging to be let in. The room seemed empty. Oh, it could have been easy. A short, ten-step walk, had that been all. <laughs> oh, if only. When she'd opened the door, the moaning had only grown louder. Someone or something, was inside the room. Taking only one step forward, Angelica took her phone from her pocket before she proceeded. Lighting the flashlight app, she scanned the light across the ground as she continued forward. She saw what she was very quick to hear. Each step she took sounded moist, almost like she was walking across a mark. Below her, the floor glimmered with liquid that was black and putrid. She could only imagine what it was. Something moulded from the ancient lumber, perhaps. Despite this, the air was incredibly stagnant and dry, and yet suddenly pungent with odours that Angelica could not describe. She hesitated entering the actual room. Wandering the floor was too unstable, wondering if it was safe. But she couldn't stop. Not now she was so close. Not when she had no idea what was making that awful, growing sound. Oh, the moaning, the tormented groaning, coming from just up ahead. Her feet nearly sticking to the floor in the awful liquid, she trudged forward, 
entering the main body of the large bedroom. She shone her light around, forgetting about the window, forgetting about her goal for just long enough. Just long enough, perhaps, to see the impossible. There was nothing there. The floor, although wet and decaying, was barren. There was no furniture, no closets for anyone to hide inside. Nothing present to make any kind of moaning. In fact, the moaning had seemed to stop once she'd entered the chamber. Angelica began to wonder if it had ever even been real. Giving her entire body a good, cleansing shake, Angelica reached over and pulled the blinds open on the window. Sunlight flooded the room. She stuck her tongue out and flipped the bird as a wildly ecstatic Felicia jumped around and took her picture. You did it! I can't believe it! You crazy bitch! I can't believe you actually did it! Angelica, sticking her tongue out in disgust at how much dust had settled there, pried the window open to shout back. <laughs> no ghosts up here, bitch. You're doing it next. No way, Felicia said. I'm not that dumb, unlike some people I know. Screw you, Angelica murmured, slamming the window shut. Moving for the door, she looked down at her phone to quickly check her messages. Make people think I'm chicken, Angelica asked herself. Make them think I'm wrong? I don't think so. I mean, could you even imagine? She stopped mid-sentence. There was a zipping sound behind her, and the sunlight disappeared from the room. Aiming her flashlight at the window, Angelica was shocked to see that the blinds had fallen on their own once more blocking the window. Before she could even mutter to herself, What the? She heard the moaning once more. Just in time, she turned to see the door slam shut in front of her, trapping her inside the room. Frozen, she could only move her eyes, and they wandered. They wandered from the door, the soaking wet floor, and from the floor they moved up. Following the light, they wandered up the side of the wall and across the ceiling. Angelica couldn't breathe. She couldn't scream. There, stuck to the walls, were dozens of decaying, digesting bodies. They were trapped, sucked inside grotesque, pulsating masses of red flesh. Most had been reduced to nothing but grey, petrified bones, with pulsating tendrils linking them to the mounds of encompassing tissue. It was feeding off of them, stripping them bare. Most had been fairly well digested, but some were fresher, some still bled. Particularly one body, stuck right on the wall next to the short entryway. He still had plenty of skin. He still had a fresh face. Claws, or perhaps teeth, protruded from the wall around his body, rippling along his entire height, digging into him in slow, coursing intervals. Covering the man's mouth, there was a mask of almost clear, mucus-like tissue, enough to prevent the still-living, still-breathing teenager from doing anything. Well, anything other than moan. And that was what it wanted. That's why the teeth stabbed him over and over again, to get him to moan. Angelica gasped as all the teeth plunged into the teen's flesh and he let out a final, choked scream of pain. The boy had been bait, and with the door shut, the trap had been sprung. Angelica tried to get back to the window, but it was no use. Her feet had been glued fast to the floor. She tried to call Felicia, 
but shapes quickly swarmed her from the sides of the wall, surrounding her in a warm, pulsating mass. Angelica had been right. The Usterling place wasn't haunted, but it was worse, much, much worse. The Usterling's house wasn't haunted. The Usterling's house was alive. Very alive and very hungry. Pa, get in here. Dinner's ready. Hold on, Ma. It's almost commercial. It sounded just like Kyle's Ma and Pa. They talked just like them. They moved just like them. They even called each other Ma and Pa. Just like them. But they weren't Kyle's ma and pa. Kyle was bound to the chair at the kitchen table, but not physically. He was trapped there because he was too afraid to move anywhere else. Overhead, the dangling lamp swayed and rocked, casting a flickering and unstable light over the messy wooden table. Blood, still horribly fresh, ran across it, dripping off the sides. Kyle could see her moving around the edges of the light, she was slow, bulky, moving and swaying about the room. He saw her hands every now and then, entering the light, setting silverware down on the table. Her skin was stained red. It was his ma's skin, but it wasn't his ma. A buzzing grew through Kyle's right. He caught the waves of fleeting shimmer in his peripheral vision. The TV set was on, but no channel played. Static waves rolled busily across the small screen. He could almost see, in the glow of the TV, a silhouette that lay across Pa's favourite armchair in the furthest corner of the living room. His Pa's chair. But that wasn't his Pa who sat there. Not completely. Are you coming, Pa? she asked. Dinner's ready. It was two in the morning. The TV fell dark. Kyle turned away, bringing his chin to his chest like an embarrassed child, as the silhouette rose from the chair. He heard the great, lumbering footsteps as the thing, as Pa, approached. Each step fell like hooves upon his house's wooden floor. Yep, the thing pretending to be Pa said. You happy now, Ma? I just don't want it to get cold, Pa. I worked very hard on this meal. That you did, Ma. That you did. Carl trembled as the thing pulled out Pa's chair, the one just to Kyle's right. The wood chair protested and bemoaned the thing's weight as it sat down. Eyes closed. He listened as Ma's chair to his left squealed just as well. Both of them pulled themselves closer bringing their bellies right up to the table side. At the edge of his vision, Kyle saw both creatures each extend him a hand. Not Ma, said to him. Come on, honey. Not Pa, said to him. We gotta pray, son. Together, they said, take our hands. Kyle's head rose, slowly and fearfully. Weak, Shaking, he extended his hands. He felt like vomiting as their taut, frigid skin met his own. But it wasn't their skin. Not really. In the light, they could see he was crying, and he could see them. What had once been his Mars and Pa's faces were stretched tightly over long, monstrous countenances. They wore his parents' skin as if they were nothing more than clothing clothing they barely fit into. Emerging from both his ma's and pa's mouths, long, naked, bony snouts protruded, like those of a deer. Antlers erupted from torn flesh in his parents' scalps. Through their fingertips, razor-sharp claws raked against Kyle's naked, human pa. All the parts that those damn creatures just couldn't fit inside his parents' skin. Pa, 
the creature said in exactly his ma's voice. Would you like to say grace? No, the other said in exactly his ma's voice. I think Carl should. I don't think anything else would be appropriate. Both turned painfully slowly to look at Kyle, and they waited. Kyle said nothing, but neither creature seemed unwilling to wait. Patiently, they both encouraged him onwards. Go on, son, one said. Make your ma and me proud. I know you can do it, sweetie, the other whispered. You did it so well for us earlier. Pray to him. Pray to God. He did pray earlier, but not for them. He'd prayed for the two corpses that lay on the table, the bodies from which all the blood had flowed, the bodies that he had once known as Ma and Pa, the raw, naked bodies whose skin the two creatures beside him had stolen, the dinner that the two creatures spoke of. Stammering and soft enough that just he could hear it, Kyle began to pray. Blessed Holy Father, protect our spirits and deliver us from evil. As he continued, the two creatures bowed their skeletal snouts. Be my parents' keeper and deliver them to the kingdom of heaven. And then he paused. The creatures had both started to heave, to cough. And for a moment, there was hope inside Kyle. Hope in the power of prayer. It sounded, almost, like the creatures were choking. Like they'd been hurt by some divine intervention. But only a moment. Soon, as their noises grew, and their heads raised, Kyle understood. They hadn't been harmed. The dry, heaving noise they made with wide-open jaws was nothing more than laughter. Sick, evil laughter. Kyle closed his eyes and continued praying, raising his voice, trying to drown out the monsters that wouldn't release his hands. Their laughter only ceased when Kyle could pray no more, and one reached upwards towards the light. Grabbing the light bulb firm in her hand, the one that pretended to be Ma said in a cheerful yet sinister voice, Let's eat. She pulled, and she banished the light from their table. We shouldn't go, Jesse Waller had said before the three of them set off that morn. Them's butcher's woods. Now, Jesse Waller lay dead on the ground, nearly a mile into the butcher's woods. Gazing out from the abandoned shack, Tony Boone could clearly see him. He lay not ten feet from the front door, blood running from his gashed neck. He was only ten feet from safety. It stood right above him. The butcher. It was everything their grandparents had warned them about when they were kids. But now it was more than just fanciful, terrible stories. Now it was real. Something palpable. Now it had just murdered one of Tony's oldest friends. The beast was an ill shade of white, with taut skin that was thin enough to almost be translucent. It hovered above Jesse's body almost like a wolf, leaning forward to bring its lengthy snout just inches away from Jesse's lifeless eye. The butcher had no eyes, and no eyes could be seen at all on its face. The only orifice visible was a small, human-like mouth at the end of its horse-like snout. That mouth opened, and a black tongue emerged from between its very human teeth. It licked the blood from Jesse's throat with a wide smile. Feeling like he wanted to scream, Tony turned from the window and slid down the shack's mossy wall. He shook as his mouth gaped, struggling to breathe. Silent tears warmed his cheek. Hearing the creature snort, he turned his gaze back outside. He'd been so shocked, seeing Jesse murdered right in front of him, 
he'd almost forgotten what the creature still held beneath its front arms. The third member of their party, the man who was still alive, Bill Dixon. One of its mighty, clawed hands clamped shut around his face so he couldn't scream. Beneath the butcher's weight, the scrawny man could only do so much. Tony could only watch as the young man's hands flailed in short, spastic attacks that failed to accomplish anything. He couldn't even phase the large beast. He was completely at the butcher's mercy. And Tony knew... From those old stories his grandpappy used to tell him by the fireplace, what happens next? He could see it on the creature's back. All along the creature's backbone and sides sprouted about a dozen terrible spines, each one probably as large as an elephant's tusk, looking like it had been carved out of bone and sharpened to a razor's edge. A few were broken, snapped at the base. They splintered like logs. Bloodstains stretched across the handful that were intact, but on a few of them, they still carried more than bloodstains. Two of the spikes still held flesh, dangling from them the remains of the last two unfortunate individuals to cross the butcher's path. There's a reason it's called the butcher, Tony mouthed in fear, because it saves its meat on hooks for later. The nearly skeletal remains hung from the butcher's spines like puppets. What little sinews and cloth remained were all that held the two together, and Tony could see where tooth and claw had stripped and pulled bare the flesh off what had once been two men. In a moment that made Tony's eyes widen, a realization cruelly barged into his racing mind. It came to Tony when the beast had reared itself up like a bear, with Jesse in one hand and a still struggling class Bill in the other, Tony realized what was about to happen. When it did happen, Tony had to gag himself with his own muddy hand to keep his screams in check. It started with Jesse, since he struggled the least. Holding him in its right hand, the creature contorted its joints to bring Jesse to rest on a spine that protruded right behind the beast's near visible ribs on the side closest to the shack. Tony winced as the spine entered Jesse's corpse with a sickening crunch. The creature released, allowing Jesse's body to settle onto the slightly upwards tilted spike. Jesse's head dangled and swayed, his matted brown hair covering his face. But then, Tony started to shake his head and back away from the window when the creature placed both of its evil hands on Bill's shoulders. No! Bill shouted, his mouth finally free and his voice cracking. No! Don't you do it! Please! Don't you do- Help! Help! Anyone, please! Help! Tony saw as the creature, holding Bill just in front of its wicked chest, turned Bill around so he was facing the forest. Tony saw as the creature started bringing its arms in slowly, pulling Bill towards its chest. Tony saw the one jagged-edged spine that protruded right from the creature's sternum. It was cruel how slowly it happened, and Tony knew that the butcher intended it to be so. As Bill screamed, Tony couldn't help but watch as the creature drove the spine through his best friend's torso. The scream. The wails were unimaginable. Tony could taste blood in his mouth as his aching teeth sunk into his own numb flesh. He wanted to do something, anything, but what? There had been three of them once. Now, now, it was just him. And the butcher knew that too. Tony had no time to mourn, to weep. For the creature allotted no time for grieving. It had two of the three transgressors, and now it needed the third. Tony ducked for the darkest corner in the shed as the butcher scuttled close. It leaned in, craning its long neck towards the window. It searched for him, using only God knew what unseen senses. Tony curled up in the protective cover of shadow, scarcely breathing, waiting for it to leave. 
All the while, Bill showed no sign of dying, for his screams, curses and shouts still carried strong on the wind. Help! Oh God, please! Oh, it hurts! It's killing me, please! As a trembling Tony waited, he listened as Bill's pleads started to change. Tony! He screamed pleadingly. Tony, if you can hear me, run! You, you gotta run, Tony! Don't, don't let it find you! You gotta, you gotta run! Run! Tony didn't want to. The last thing he wanted to do was leave them. Jesse deserved better. He deserved to be buried at home, where his family could see him. And to leave Bill like that? To leave him alive in that thing's clutches? Tony would, almost, rather die. But if he could make it, get back home, he would rally more hunters than those woods had ever known. He could make the butcher rue the day, he thought. He could make it rue everything. He could avenge his friends. Or oh, you could survive, whispered a darker voice inside his head, and stay away. The butcher circled the shack many times, searching for something, anything. Tony could feel its frustration growing as it growled beyond the doors, as it swiped its claws at the shack's wooden frame. It knew he was close, but it didn't know where. Eventually, and to Tony's initial disbelief, the butcher retreated. Tony could tell as its heavy footsteps fell away, and Bill's tormented cries faded into the distance. When everything had grown silent, silent except for the bird calls and the rustling of leaves in the wind, and it had been that way for a good long while, Tony made his move. Cautiously, he pushed open the shack's front door, and he peered into the woods. It must have been past noon, but the mist that morning had brought still hung thick between the trees. But Tony wasn't expecting to rely on his sight. He was expecting to rely almost completely on his ears. As he ran, sprinted, bolted the mile back out of the woods. He listened. It nearly froze him to the spot the first time, but it happened just as he expected it would. Like a siren coming from the distance, he heard Bill's cries echo out as the creature galloped closer. It happened once, twice, again and again, and each time Bill's cries saved Tony's life. If he thought he heard them in the distance, for even a moment, Tony would duck for cover and cower beneath some log or within some rotted tree basin until the distant wells had once again faded to the horizon. And then he would start again. It stretched the mile into near infinity, having to stop so often. It turned every several hundred feet into a lifetime. But he persisted. It almost sickened him, using his friend the way he did. Do what you have to do, he thought to himself. Do what you have to do to get out of here, to survive. He had originally told himself he would survive for Bill, for Jesse. Yet the closer Tony got to the forest's edge, the less and less he wanted to ever return. Each time Bill's screams faded, it became easier and easier to forget to find that drive to survive. They laid him up inside, but Tony never intended to come back. I'm sorry, he whispered as the edge of the forest approached. It was my fault we even came here. The trees were about to break. He hadn't heard the beast, hadn't heard Bill in what felt like hours. I'll never make that mistake again. He tripped right before he made it to the opening. Crawling forward, he tried to keep the momentum moving as he rolled onto his back and kicked at the leaves with his feet. Logic told him it was a branch, a stump, a root of that mighty oak he'd just passed. He could have tripped on anything. Instinctually, however, he knew what had happened before he hit the ground. He looked at that broad oak, 
and to its shadow. That's where it stood, on its hind legs, heaving mighty, warm breaths. Crouched ever so slightly forward, it held its hands on Bill's wriggling form. One was cupped over his mouth, the other around his still, squirming throat. It had silenced him. It had waited. Craning its neck down, right beside Bill's cherry-red face, it tilted its head almost inquisitively. Its lips audibly split. Its smile was indescribable, with simply any other word but wicked. The cavern opened up just ahead, and the poor damned soul crawled his way into the freeing space. But he wasn't out of hell just yet. The dark rocky chamber he'd found wasn't empty, and he wasn't alone. The other, who stood in the middle of the cavern, before two wooden doors, outstretched its long, wiry arms and bid him welcome. Weary, and with a nearly feral snarl, the damned soul told the other, I have fought my way through demons and nightmares to get here, through blood and torture, and through torment and torment after torment. Don't think I won't fight you too. But the creature, whose face was featureless, spoke to the damned soul and said, But we are not here to fight you. You are free to proceed as you choose. You are free to proceed as you choose. You are free to a single choice, but be warned, for we stand at guard for not just the doorway of salvation, but of darkness and despair as well. The man, confused at the creature's prattling, asked, Who is we? The creature, who was covered in a long, tattered black cloak, reached up to its naked face, where its right eye should have been. Its long, pale claws peeled away its skin, Underneath, in what should have been an empty cavity, naked, chattering teeth spoke. There is no we. As the damned soul watched, the creature tore free the flesh from its left side as well, exposing not an eye, but another set of jaws. This second set of jaws then spoke and said, There are three. I am Kesedu, the other. It said, alluding to the first set of eyes. The other, it said, alluding to the first set of eyes, is called Imadax. Finally, with its long index finger, the creature carved across its face, from cheek to cheek, as if opening a zipper, and the final, largest set of jaws smiled through the gap. It concluded by saying, in the loudest voice of all, And I am called Loki Vera. Together our tongues are called Fictusos, the Guardian. The naked, damned soul inch forward towards the still warm, still welcoming spectre. Cautiously he cast his glance over the creature's thin shoulders. You seek passage? asked Loki Verat. Yes, you seek one of our doors, chattered the voice called Imadax. Either mine or the door of Kesedu. There were indeed two doors. One was on the creature's left, the eluded door of Kesedu, and one was on its right, the eluded door of Imidax. Both were wooden. Both were identical. Both were unmarked. How am I to know which is which? asked the damned soul. That is why we are here, of course, hissed Loki Verat, to uh, guide you. But be warned, spoke Kesedu. The choice is not to be made lightly. If I choose wrongly, asked the damned soul. As we said, Loki Verat said, raising a cautionary finger. One door leads to salvation, but only one. Choose poorly, and you will receive only endless despair, endless darkness. It can't be worse than what I've seen, the damned soul croaked fearfully. To this, all three mouths responded in short. They chuckled. The damned soul, closely watching the guardian as he did so, 
moved nearer to the two doors. On a closer inspection, he cursed. He didn't know which one to pick. Careful, Loki Verat warned from behind. Once chosen, you cannot go back. You may risk the odds if you'd like. Or, the damn soul inquired, aware that there was a deal to be made. Or, you can hear our riddle, came all three voices at once. The only assistance we can offer you, said Imadax. The desperate, damned soul decided that it was the only way. He had come much too far, and sacrificed too much to let this stop him. He came before the Guardian, and before the Guardian's three tongues. Imidax, Kessidu, and Loki Verat. He stood before them and asked of them what riddle they had planned for him. Before you are two doors, Imidax said. The doors you see belong to me and Kesedu, and through one of them is your path to salvation. You may ask one question, Kesedu said, to any of our tongues, one and only one, and that is all you are permitted. After, Loki Verat warned, you will be on your own with nothing more than the information that we have bestowed upon you. You must choose your question carefully, but... Even more so than the question, you must be wary of whom you ask. Kessidu smirked. Because, between Imidax and I, one of us lies. And the other tells the truth, Imidax sneered. One of us will speak freely, Kessidu promised. And all, Loki Verat concluded, will try to deceive. You must make two choices now, and I say now, most honestly, consider them well. So, the damned soul thought. He thought on the riddle for a time left unmeasured. After so long in damnation, the time he spent on anything mattered so little to him. It mattered little to the guardian either, who stood there watching the damned soul with greedy fingers interlocked, and a gaping grin across all of its faces. It was a riddle of two doors. A riddle of two doors and two guards. One door to freedom, to salvation. And one door to instant death, darkness and despair. As the Guardian had clearly said. One must lie, able to speak freely as Kesedu had said. And the other would be honest, although hoping to deceive by being indistinguishable from the liar. The guards were Imidax and Kesedu. One must have been the liar, and one must have been the honest tongue. The answer was so elusive. It seemed to dance around just out of the damned soul's reach for the longest time. He couldn't ask them which door was safe, for he knew not which of the two was the honest tongue. He couldn't ask them which one was the honest guard for the same reason. He couldn't ask a question to prove which one was honest, for even though he could, he could ask them a math question, an equation with a factual answer, and he knew to prove who the liar was, but it would leave him without an answer for the door. But there had been an answer to the riddle. He knew this. There was a question, a singular question, that, when asked to the truth-teller or the liar, would reveal the correct answer each time. It existed. And the damn soul was positive he could find it. When, and only when, the damn soul was positive of the answer, did he come forward. I've thought, he said cockily, and I know what I must ask. I know that one of you will now answer falsely, and another will be truthful. He pointed at the door on the guardian's right. I could ask Imidax if that's the correct door. But I have no idea if Imidax is the liar or not. Same for Kessidu. It leaves me the same chances. The Guardian tilted its head, almost as if with an acute fascination. But I don't need to do that, the damn soul said. I know one tongue. One of your demon eyes will speak freely and tell the truth. The Guardian's maws all stretched wide in sinister grins 
causing the man to hesitate. The guardian seemed pleased. The other will lie, he continued, less confidently, and try to deceive, which means there is only one question I can ask. There's only one question that, when asked, either the honest or the dishonest guard will reveal, in both scenarios, the false door. Because one will be honest and one must lie. One will be honest about the liar, and one will lie about who is honest. The damn soul smirked. Hmm, I've heard this riddle before. The damn soul pointed up, right at Imidax, and he asked his question. Which door will Kesitu tell me to pick? Imidax, guard of the left door, opened his mouth, ready to speak, and then, hesitantly, it said, He would tell you to take the door on your right. The damned soul, for the first time in a long while, laughed. He laughed and laughed, for he knew he had won. So, he said. The door on the left is the one. It's your door, Imidax, because the liar would tell me to take the right door, and the honest of you would tell me what the liar would say. Either way, you both have given me the false answer. Am I right? Did I solve your damn riddle? The guardian did not answer. The damn soul knew why. His question had been spent. The only response it could offer was silence. All the smiles had faded from its face, granting it an entirely passive and impartial visage. The Guardian rotated in place, following as if with unseen eyes as the damned soul crossed the room. Past the creature, the damned soul put his hand on the left door. For a moment, he wondered what it would be like on the other side. He asked himself what he would do first. Run. Roll in the grass. Swim in the ocean. Lie beneath the stars. He wondered how much had changed as he pushed the door open, stepped through, and allowed it to shut behind him. From the moment it shut, the smiles fractured back onto the guardian's face. All three mouths chuckled, for they knew the truth. The damn soul hadn't been terribly foolish, but he had failed to truly listen. In that failure to truly listen, the damn soul had made two fatal assumptions. His first assumption, the assumption that their game started when he asked his question, a failure to recognize that it had started from the moment the damn soul entered that chamber. The failure to realize that, from the very beginning, all three tongues had been in character, and that assumption allowed the second to take hold, not by accident, but by design. His second assumption, the assumption that only two of the voices had mattered, the assumption that Loki Verat was inconsequential. For one mouth will speak the truth, said Loki Verat truthfully. One will speak freely, Kesedu said, as it wished. None will lie, said Imidax, falsely. And all, said the Guardian in unison, stepping forward, revealing the third and final door that had been hidden beneath its cloak, will try to deceive. The night sky split in two, bisected by a brilliant light. The darkness parted, falling away like receding waves on an obsidian shore. Thunder, the sound of the waves crashing back together, returning the sky to the night, drowning the fields and the woods beneath its crushing weight. Little Stuart Browning couldn't sleep. He'd undone his own covers and rolled onto his belly to stare out of his window, Lightning struck once more, way beyond the germinating fields, somewhere beyond that grey horizon. Sleep didn't come easy on stormy nights, not for Stuart. 
His mother said he took after her, but he didn't. Her anxiety fueled her thunder-triggered insomnia, whereas Stuart felt drawn to the sights and sounds with an acute fascination. She'd called it God's wrath, but Stuart saw no anger in the clouds, nothing more, perhaps, than a solemn regret. Eyes wide, and with no want of sleep, Stuart watched. Each bolt, each lash, restored a life to the earth, to her sky. It uncovered the field stretching for acres on the horizon, his own empty backyard and the creek that separated the two. There were the woods to his right, standing tall and imposingly over the young fields. A single playset, where a swing gently swayed, as if the wind pushed on an invisible jockey. The rainless storm persisted. A flash of light and then a booming thunder. Flash of light, booming thunder. Flash of light, flash of light, flash of light. Stuart cautiously rose to his knees, edging himself closer to the window. His palm met the glass's icy face. He waited. Flash of light. Wrong. It was all wrong. The thunder had gone. He couldn't hear anything anymore. Rubbing his eyes, scratching his ears, nothing changed. Flash of light. Stuart wondered if he'd fallen asleep. No, he would know. If he was asleep, it wouldn't feel right. Everything would be off, not just the lightning. He wouldn't feel the soft cushioning of his bed beneath his knees, the sharp kiss of the chilly moisture on the window pane. If it were all a dream, he could wake up. He couldn't wake up from this. Flash of light. Questioning his own ears, he snapped, and he heard it, crisp and sharp. His snap seemed to echo in the silence, causing him to childishly recoil, as if somehow his snap would have awoken his parents in the middle of a thunderstorm. His ears worked fine, but it didn't change a thing. There was still no thunder. It was like someone had put the storm on mute. He wondered, perhaps, if his window had somehow blocked the sound. Unlocking his window, Stuart pried it open and listened. Whistling wind, echoes of distant rain, Another flash of light, but still no thunder. But there was something else. Stuart had been listening, but now, well, now he was watching. In the next silent bolt, his eyes were caught by an invisible hook and pulled straight to the fields. Darkness had taken over, covering his vision. He didn't know what he glimpsed, he couldn't recall, but... It had made his heart quiver. Slamming his window shut out of instinct, he waited for that next strike. It came, and he frantically searched for something, anything at all unusual, looking for what he'd seen before. His heart didn't settle. It couldn't. So he waited again. This time, this time, he knew he'd found it. The field should have been empty, freshly tilled, freshly planted. Nothing had, as of yet, sprouted. Nothing on that earthen plain should have stood taller than a few millimetres. But something did. In the briefest of seconds, Stuart saw something tall in the middle of the field. It was distant, but certainly hadn't been there before. In that moment, he thought maybe it was a post. The farmers used scarecrows before. It would make sense. Except, it wouldn't explain how it got there. A flash of light. A flash of light. And this time Stuart focused on that spot where he'd seen the tall thing before. It wasn't there. Not in that spot, but Stuart did find it. 
the tall thing had moved. It had moved closer. Stuart wasn't sure of it, not until the next flash confirmed that the thing, the shape, was getting closer and closer with each flash of ominous lightning. Worse, Stuart no longer believed it was a post. No post moved on its own. Another flash. No post had two legs. Another flash. No post had two flailing arms. Another flash, and no post could ever run. Someone was coming across the field, fast. Stuart gasped as the lightning showed him the figure in motion. Long legs carried the strange someone quickly across the rugged fields in leaping, almost predatory motions. The arms, spindly and gaunt, were poised at the figure's front, coiled like a praying mantis. Stuart gasped in the silence of the night. Another flash. The figure grew closer. Another flash. The figure bounded across the empty fields. Another flash. The figure had leapt across the border creek. And in that leap, Stuart had seen what he hadn't, couldn't, to have imagined. The thing wasn't human. It was hunched forward, granting it a raptor-like posture. It wore no clothes, but had a pale, almost luminescent skin. Its legs were muscular, like a dog's, with long toes and ragged hair. It propelled itself forward, making a mad dash directly for Stuart's house. Worst of all, with the next flash, Stuart noticed the creature was staring upwards, towards the house, towards his bedroom window, towards him. He saw no eyes. Where there should have been was only the place where the lightning couldn't banish the dark. There were soulless patches of nothingness. Contrasting colour shone from its nose and around its neck. Sickeningly, Stuart realised the monster reminded him of a clown. Its pointed nose and neck, which was inflated with accordion-like flaps of stretched skin, seemed to bleed with a bright crimson. Its smile hung low on its tall face, and it stretched wide. Stuart was paralysed. He didn't scream when the darkness returned once again. That was the worst of it all. Each and every time the darkness fell, Stuart wanted to pretend that it didn't exist, that it was impossible, but he knew better. He knew that in the darkness, it just kept coming. Lightning showed that it had reached his fence now, perching atop it with a hungry grin. It pounced from its perch just before the light relented and the returning night seemed to hit Stuart like a freight train. It was in his yard now, slinking towards his house somewhere in the black, towards his back door. He should have screamed, but it felt too wrong, too out of place in the calm, eternal silence. How long would this next stretch of darkness last? Seconds? Minutes? All night. What if the storm had ended? How would he know where the creature had gone? Would the creature leave with the storm? Oh, he could only hope. He could only listen. Leaning forward, and with all the bravery he could muster, little Stuart pried open the window. The wind whispered. Everything was dark. Everything was dark, and then it wasn't. With a shocking, bellowing thunder, lightning struck just once more, right in the Browning's backyard. It masked Stuart's screams as it shone brightly upon the tortuous face right outside his open window.
We looked up one night, and there it was. The moon had grown an eye. Scientists could only tell us one thing, something we already knew. It was massive. Thousands of kilometers across, it covered more than half of the full moon, easily seen by our naked, tiny eyes. It looked human. Brown iris that dilated during the day. Black pupil so dark that it made the night sky glisten. We had no idea what it was, or how it had come to be. The fear it sparked in us was primal. It was the same feeling our ancestors must have felt when they still lived in the plains. The fear they knew when a predator had set its gaze upon them. The only difference between us and our ancestors, however, was that we had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. That fierce gaze, the penetrating glare that injected us all with sacrilegious fear, came from the heavens themselves. Inescapable. There was nothing to do. It followed us at night, but during the day was worse. Sometimes you could still see it, and follow it in the sky, but on the days when you couldn't, then no one wanted to move. Seeing the predator watch you was one thing, but knowing it was still out there, still watching, but knowing that you can't find it, that was the worst. People talked in whispers. They stuck to the shadows, as if doing any of that would settle their unease. Even though NASA launched probes only days after it first appeared, no good came of it. Nothing was discovered, because... By the time most of those probes landed, the unthinkable had happened. The eye had vanished. It was as if it had never existed. The moon returned to how it had been before. Irregular, barren, lifeless. The only evidence that the eye had ever existed were the pictures and videos we'd all taken. Remnants of an awful nightmare that nobody could forget. One of the few things, like creation, that we couldn't explain. It was nice when we thought it was over. I know most people had hoped it was. Even when the eye had been gone for months, there were still many people who wondered if it would, or even could, ever happen again. After all, no one could ever have imagined it would have ever happened to begin with. The eye didn't return. But I think I would have preferred it if it did. Because now, sitting there in the moonlit sky, a mouth stretches from pole to pole. And it is smiling at us. So a fantastic group of stories for you there, eight in all. What did you think of them? I loved them. I thought they were all great. Hopefully putting you in the mood for Halloween. Not quite there yet, but, well, it's nice to build up early and uh, get ourselves in the mood for it, isn't it? <laughs> a lot less controversial than my video on Monday, I, I will hopefully see. Anyway, that one uh, got a lot of comments. Not all particularly nice, but, well, I enjoyed Monday's story. Set on the seas, but not everyone liked the accuracy of it. But what are you going to do? Well... I will be back again on Friday with another long story for you. Can you believe it? Well, just tune in and you'll find out. <laughs> but until then, my dear friends, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, 
the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>